Hello, this is Denise Hudson. Welcome to the UCLA Design Showcase West Salon. This is the production designers panel, and today we're going to meet John Pano, who designed The Morning Show, Mark Worthington, who designed Mythic Quest, Raven's Banquet, and Naaman Marshall, who designed Servant. Great. Hi, you guys. There they all are. Hello. Hi. Hi. All right, we're gonna go. We're gonna see clips of each of your shows, and then you're gonna give us a couple of minutes description of what they are, and then we're gonna go to questions and talk to you all. Take Three. it away. Eight seconds to you. Cue her. Good morning. I'm bringing you some sad and upsetting news. And while I don't know the details of the allegations, she's throwing me under the bus. Mitch Kessler, my co-host and partner of 15 years, was fired today. You we are facing the biggest crisis in our history. Oh, wait, 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 wait. My life just ended for no good reason. We're in the middle of an epic rebirth. Her sell-by date expired years ago. I want you to start grooming some new people. I don't fit the mold. What mold is that? Any mold, really? Your show sucks. Thank you. It's Thank barely you. news. I want wardrobe tests, screen tests, makeup tests. We need a contract. Where's legal? Ready? I'm ready. Most people want to trust that the person that is telling them about the world is an honest person. Like you. Yes. Your words spoke to America. People are noticing they want more. Watching a beloved woman's breakdown is timeless American entertainment. I just need to be able to control the narrative so that I'm not written out of it. Is the undisputed you stole my life. You left me in the woods with a pack of wolves. You just think I'm gonna do this? This chair could be yours. I don't want your job. Oh, hi. You walk out that door, you are never gonna get back in. The part you guys never seem to realize is that you don't have the power anymore. And frankly, I've let you bozos handle this long enough. We are doing this my way. What happened to your TV? We had a disagreement. John, funny. It looks good. I've watched it. It's terrific. Can you tell Thank tell you. us a little bit about the design process and how it all began? Um, or however you want to talk about it. Oh yeah. The um, this was a really interesting challenge because the you know um, <clears throat> when I took the job, I thought I'm going to have fun with this set, which I did. <laughs> but there is. There's such a history behind these shows that I thought I could play with, but I really couldn't because I went to the Today Show. I went to uh, Good Morning America, and I, you know, did a lot of research. There is so much technical uh, considerations that you have to take into account when designing this set. Our show was not only about the broadcast set, but we had, you know, ped cameras filming the broadcast set. And then we had our film crew filming them. So mm -hmm. this set had to be versatile. It had to work with both uh, camera formats. We also built a fully functional control room that this set had to, you know, there was no cut to, we'll put everything in green screen. Everything was live, everything worked. So I thought I could treat it more like scenery, but no, it, it was more about I have to deal with LED screens. I have to deal with all the streaming technology. We have to make assets. So it was mind boggling. It was like making another network. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, this network 
had to feel like it had been around, you know, for 70 years and actually had started from a radio program, kind of like, you know, Rockefeller Center. But we didn't want it to look like, you know, 30 Rock or anything like that. This show is about the transition from, even though it's a morning show, from news to entertainment. And it's also about, um, you know, the sexual harassment and the women taking, you know, Jennifer taking control of the show. Um, so that transition um, between broad, you know, news and kind of like computer technology, like this, this set has so much computer technology in it, more so than probably um, a regular uh, morning show set would have. And I, that was one of the themes I was kind of poking around with. Traveling back and forth to New York, I had noticed how much there are LED screens everywhere now. It's like Tokyo. So that glow, the transparency of the set, the glow of the LEDs was another theme worked in. So these are some of the things that I tried to explore. But when you see the corridors of the backstage, they're very plain and they're actually you know, like a broadcast studio like CBS would be in Midtown, plain, beat up rental furniture, gray walls, tiny, because this used to be a radio stage. So I really enjoyed the juxtaposition of this fairy tale. You know, when Reese shows up, it's like, oh my God, this glowing, you know, Disneyland that she is, you know, striving for and the backstage element and you know the control room and you know you know that is very pedestrian so those that those are some of the juxtapositions and themes that i wanted to explore in the show and i think you were really successful i think it it plays just like you described that you were aiming for oh great yeah and i also just didn't want it to be too um you know the, the an important thing that we all wanted um even though the set is a little techie high techie that if you were flipping the channels and you went past this, you'd go, oh, yeah, I believe it. Well, you know, what's on, you know, what's, what else is on? So that's also was a, a juxtaposition to explore. Totally works. I think it's great. Thanks. Okay, let's go on to our next one. In a world of legendary heroes, one man will rise to take all of the credit. This game has something that no one else will. Me. We go to work, 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 work. This is where the magic happens. Hey, can I get a coffee? I'm coming, Iron! Everybody has that game that they fell in love with because they make an impact. Those games were somebody's legacy. Well, this is my legacy. Our legacy. Our legacy, whatever. It's not my legacy. <laughs> I have a BA in women's studies. What exactly is women's studies? It follows the experiences of women and the contributions they've made to... Inquiry withdrawn. Quick thing, I'm, I'm worried about the time. Yeah, David, I'm moving as fast as I can. It's not my fault that these watermelons don't explode like real heads. I can get you real heads. Not human. That's commitment. I built your vision. It's like you're this brilliant painter, and I'm your favorite brush. I'm just some tool to create your masterpiece. I like that metaphor, but it's not quite right, is it? I Are think you seriously you about to noodle on my metaphor right now? I know that I can be difficult, Papa. You can't give up. We're like the Beatles. <laughs> Together, we make masterpieces. I could write the lyrics and the music and everything, but it would sound completely different without the drums. Wait, I'm Ringo? Well, yeah, of course you're Ringo. I mean, look, somebody's got to keep the beat. Oh, my God! At least you brought me breakfast. Oh, this is mine. It's prescription. A prescription bagel? Legally, you're actually not allowed to ask me about Whatever. it. Whatever. Well, tell us about the show, how you began, how you approached it. Uh, there's a number of questions from the students about this show, but tell us now and then we'll get to the questions later. Well, I'd never done half hour before, so this was really fun getting into this. I had a good friend of mine, Matt Shackman, who directed a lot of Sunny in Philadelphia with Rob. He and I were going to do a film. It all fell through. And then he said, you know, 
hey, if you, you know, if you're looking for a job, which I was, it was fall, instead of in between, Rob's looking for somebody to design this new comedy. And I'd always loved Sunny in Philadelphia because it was one of the first sort of really dystopian comedies in the US. It sort of was a trendsetter. It was, you know, this little sort of um, almost sort dark. of cult. Yeah, a cult hit, very dark. And I love Danny DeVito. And I love anyway, so I went and I met with him and we hit it off and um, we started. We didn't have a ton of time, which is typical, uh, as I found out in that world. Um, and but we were working. It was, it was interesting because the, uh, uh, the producers, um, you know, two of the producers and one of the producing partners is Ubisoft, which is a gaming company. So we had a couple of people on site that had worked in the gaming world. And obviously, this show is all about uh, a gaming company. It's the most successful game in the world. And actually, they're coming out. The the, the title, Rob seems to like long titles, um, is, you know, uh, Mythic Rest Raven's Banquet. It's a new iteration of the game that they're putting out. So they're under all this pressure. That's the first episode. And um, so anyway, you, we, you know, we're sort of entering this world that I didn't know that much about gaming. And so, I mean, obviously you just do a bunch of research into what those offices look like. And, and a lot of them are, some of them are very prosaic and sort of boring and some of them are not. And some of the more interesting ones were Ubisoft and they wanted something that kind of referenced their world, of course, which was great. And it's a little backdated in terms of, it's not completely up to date with the architecture, which was conscious because it's been around for about 15 years. So they had an early, they were sort of the scrappy game and then they became the dominant huge game and were, were coming in at that point where they're trying to sort of renew themselves. And these people have been together for a while and they don't like each other. They're sort of trapped in a bubble by their success in this case, whereas in Sunny, they're just trapped because who else would even deal with them, right? So it's sort of a, it's a variation on that theme. So the, the sets were interesting because, um, Rob was uh, Rob had a couple of really specific things he wanted, and that was Ian Grimm, the head the, the head creative that you see in the in the preview. He wanted his office way above everybody else's. To the extent <laughs> initially he wanted it literally a story about everybody else's, which I fought him on a little bit because I was like, well, you know, it, you have to you have to be able to catch all this in the camera. So we lifted it a bit, a bit and so forth. And the I think you see in that set there are gaming characters sort of as super graphics on the walls. And that's also very sort of an obvious, fairly conscious effort to to have the various characters have avatars, you know, uh, represent you know avatars from the game in a sense, representing them around the office. Uh, and it, we play with that, especially in the last episode. So um, part of it is just you know, creating a fun, high end space since it's successful, pushing it a bit because it's, it's relatively broad comedy uh, in in some cases. Um, and, and and actually also being accurate to how these offices really work, big bullpens. And again, the executives tend to have these you know nice offices and everybody else is kind of in this grinding, awful bullpen with everybody else. Um, and there's also that sort of class distinction that goes on in the show as well. The grunts are seen as the grunts very self-consciously and Ian is seen as this kind of megalomaniac who, who lords at everybody else. Uh, but of course, has all the insecurities. Sound familiar? Um, <laughs> So it was really interesting. And David Gordon Green directed the, the first episode. He did, he most recently did, um, or I don't know what he said, absolutely most recently, but he did the um, uh, Halloween remake. And he is delightful, really fun. So it was all of those creatives together, we were able to come up with something kind of fun, so. Well, it really serves the comedy. Having a little deck for him to come come out and stand on and stand over everybody. That's wonderful too. Well, there was also a happy accident because we had, you see, it's sort of based on these, these um, square windows sort of cut into that lovely sort of beech wood and then the graphics. And we had a very small one right by his door. I think you see it in the preview. They're all on gimbals anyway, because we, we, we make the windows pivot so that you don't get bad reflections from light and in, in, you know, the half hour world, especially as I learned, you really have to have everything flexible because you're moving so fast. So anyway, those windows move and Rob being, he's a natural at finding all these little comedy bits. That one little window would pit, you could pivot open and stick your head out. So that became sort of an accident and then became this sort of ongoing, almost sort of, you know, laugh in kind of joke that was yeah. that played in a lot of the episodes. So, you know, it's always fun to have those little, those little gifts. Yeah. Yeah. All right, go. I'm sure we'll get to more questions. <laughs> But let's uh, let's go on to servant, please. Leave 
Leanne? Leanne Grayson? Hello, Mrs. Turner. Hi, I'm Sean. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Turner. You have a beautiful home. She is a godsend. I was expecting someone older, less weird. We hope you'll treat our house as your home. I'm sure you and Jericho will form an instant bond. She's cool with everything. She knows the situation. I guess we should talk about this. She's gone. You can put the doll down now. I'm fine as I am, Mr. Turner. We lost Jericho when he was 13 weeks. Dorothy took it hard. This was the only thing that brought her back. I should take Jericho for his walk now. You hired a nanny for a doll? Where did you find her? She is wonderful with Jericho. And if my baby trusts her, so do I. How much did those boys tell you about what happened? What if she wakes up? What if she remembers? Do you know who you welcomed into your home? so spooky <laughs> i started watching this and i can't wait to get back to it it really is it really pulls you in tell us it, what about it you? does it, you know when i first um when knight came to me with this project and said just read the first one and if it doesn't grab you and make you want to read the next one um then yeah. maybe it's not for you you know <laughs> and and it just kept going that way to where every time that we got a script, it was like, oh my God, you know, I thought I had it figured out. And then the next time you do the same thing. And, you know, so once I, once I decided to work the project and get into it with night and we started talking concepts on how we wanted to, to, um, to play it and how he wanted to use the house as a character and um, keep it, you know, moody and and allow the dp to really play with shapes and light and all of that then that the, you know it started getting really interesting for me as a production designer because it was like well what are we going to do are we going to find a location are we going to build it and obviously we had to build it so um we took over a facility in in philly and and turned it into a, a studio built the interior of the house all three levels and basement and then we ended up building the front yard and street and the facade across the street on the same space as well as the backyard. And, you know, we just started, you know, with night and, you know, collaborating, it just became clear that we needed the depth within the house and we needed to be able, you know, he said, I don't want, I don't want the camera to go outside of the house. Anytime it goes outside of the house, I want it to feel like, uh, like a FaceTime or, um, or news footage, you know, Dorothy's a, a news reporter. So he had this concept of always the, the story takes place in the house. And anytime we go outside of the house, um, it's, it's just for, uh, you know, short bursts, just to kind of get a breath of fresh air for a moment. Um, so, you know, that as a production designer, I was like, oh, great. We're going to be in this thing for, you know, every episode, 30 minutes, you know, every season, same house. Um, but as we started breaking it down and kind of figuring out what it needed to do and how we needed to, um, you know, play each level of the house to tell a story. Um, it, it was really interesting how much you can actually get the layers and the, the, um, just the character within the house. You really did. I mean, the the kitchen is wonderful. Okay, everybody wants that. Thank kitchen. you. But it's also there's so many little crevices and corners and 
places that you can go to. And then it's three stories, right? I'm only a few episodes in, so I haven't seen it all, but I think it's three stories and then has a basement, a wine cellar for Sean. Fabulous. Um, that wine cellar. Who doesn't want that? I'm right. I hear you built that. That was great. And then the, in the backyard, the greenhouse. Oh, I want that little greenhouse. I'm thinking about how I can put one of those at my house. <laughs> yeah, really cool stuff. So a lot of it, you know, obviously was just found stuff that we kind of incorporated when I was lo looking for the location. We actually go to location to shoot the exterior okay. when we need to look down the streets in both ways if we don't want to CG it. So we have a house in Philly for the for the a house and street for Philly for the front yard. And then for the backyard, we have another house that works for that as well. Yeah. And then on stage, we built front and back. So it could just kind of depends on how much we need. If it's just coming out the front door, if we're actually looking down the street or walking down the street. Um, yeah. So I was, you know, I was fortunate enough to get into, you know, 25 different brownstones in Philly and just kind of like pick and choose what, what I liked best about them. Oh, good. Okay, we're, we definitely need to talk more about this for the students because those are all really interesting aspects of how you get a complete sort of set or setting. It doesn't always just happen in one spot. You know, you have to find it exactly. all. Exactly, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, so go ahead. No, I didn't know if you wanted to keep going or if you want. Um, well, I think, why don't we open it up to everybody because I think we probably all have questions for each other. Let's see, I mean, that's a good place to start. One of the things, you know, where one of the questions that keeps coming up is how is is designing your, different for these series than for films, you know, or making this transition. So um, I guess each of these things were all, did any of you, you were all shot on location as well as, Mark, I don't, I didn't get to leave the studio on any of the episodes that I saw of yours, Mark, but you, but and John, do you, yeah, you leave the studio a lot, even in the, I watched a lot of that one morning show, but so um, Mark, do you ever leave the studio or did you just, did you build that in one building and never leave it? We built, yeah. I mean, again, half hour usually depends on a, you know, a, a permanent set you spend, and this is a workplace comedy. So obviously that's, you know, you're going to be there. We built, a, you know, a downstairs sort of developer's room and that sort of stuff and other places, nooks and crannies around the studio. We did leave the, the, um, uh, the green screen studio or the, the mocap studio rather you right. see in that one bit with the, with the, <laughs> with watermelons. Uh, that was a, well, because of, you know, there's always budgetary constraints, but we turned that, into a gnome, which is actually uh, my last exactly, live yeah, room. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of those. <laughs> uh, we, we're struggling to figure out how to make that work and make it real. And then, um, we, the, the DP and I just got online and said, well, are there any mocap studios around our studio? Okay. And there was one within a mile and we just Perfect. went there and found it. And it was, it was weird. And they'd actually done work for Ubisoft. So it was this strange Perfect. thing. So we went off occasionally, but it isn't, you're right. I mean, in our show, unlike you know, like a one hour where you're you're, you're going to be in locations, or certainly a film, there's there's less of that. Yeah. Did uh did any of these because this is you know this was Apple. You guys are doing some of Apple's first projects. Do you, does it feel like these are different than other shows? Is there I mean adjusting to a half an hour mark? You said and John and Naaman, yours are both an hour show long episodes, aren't they? Yeah. Half I am. Um, yeah, I don't know if they were different, um, you know, in, in, from other from HBO, which I've worked with a lot. I think with um, you know HBO, there was with me. There's a bit more familiarity, so um, you know that's always helpful. You know, working with a with a stream with any service a couple of times helps. Yeah, yeah. My my show is half hour, uh, oh, and I don't okay. have. It's my first time doing TV, so I really had no idea what how to <laughs> how to approach it. Um, and I I feel like I feel like we pushed as if it was a a movie, and we built the sets as strong as as we could to hold up and to be able to shoot in it day after day. These these sets get tortured. I mean, you just they're they're relentless. In film, um, we're so used to building sets and they get shot really quick and then you're moving on to the next one and you strike it and everybody wraps out and then you make another one. I, it was, I was surprised at how beat down these sets get and just day after day and refinishing the floors. And 
So I took a different approach with this one. I had the whole house plumbed. I had hot water heaters put in every bathroom and every, you know, the windows all had rain bars and the streets all you know, turnkey to pull in, you know, drains in the floor. I just didn't know what to wow. do other than try to make it as efficient as I possibly could. And, you know, real tile, real showers, um, sinks and garbage disposal. It was just like, I don't know what to say other than like, can't we just make it like a house guys? Um, yeah. And it paid. It paid off because we could go from we could go from room to room and and just flip a switch and it was ready to go. And the floors were real oak. So at the end of season one, I just had a floor finishing company come in and and resand and refinish them. But man, like hundreds of people every single day <laughs> was like. And did you have? Uh, did you have? A was it a stack set or did you have different floors on different in different spaces on this? I had different floors on different spaces and the staircases because I had limited height of 18 feet in these spaces. Oh. Um, my staircase went as far down as I could and as far up as I could. Um, and then we, you know, for those big long shots, we would just CG the rest of it. But yeah, it was every, every uh, floor had a, as much as you could get in that case. I'd have to say in the last six years, I haven't used a painted surface on a TV set. I'm using real marble. Yeah. We're using everything gets plumbed. Everything but the toilet works. And I'm sure someday that will work too. Uh, my, mine mine yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It did. It did. I, I, I was like, you know what? If, if we're going this far, I want to flush a toilet. Yeah. Yeah, so we did it. That's but, what TV is, you know. You know, if, yeah. if you have means, of course, but it is interesting how I mean, like we are using real surfaces. We are making yeah. houses. We are making whatever broadcast studios, everything. And that I don't I haven't I've only been doing a, a lot of TV for the past five years. But I'd have to say I've been lucky enough from the get go. That's what it's been. And and it's amazing to me because that yeah. used to never be. Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's the thing I always tell my students about. The difference because they assume that television is cheaper and then i you know i did uh, american horror story hotel and we built that entire lobby 360 the whole thing and in a in a film it, it's prescriptive you know what the scenes are and you know the action and you build to that and you can use you know scenic techniques you don't you know you can paint things you can do the rest of it but in when you don't know in the case of that show even what the next, you know, three episodes in what you're going to be dealing with, you basically have to do the whole thing, which can be a struggle with the studio because they make a certain assumption about the budgets for television and what that means. But that has changed radically since, um, you know, t since television has changed uh, with streaming. I'm not even sure we can call it TV anymore. I mean, it's I, it's such a different animal and narratively it's so much more complex that uh, that what we're what we're compelled to do is what you're talking about name and what you're talking about, John. I mean, I think we all experience it, that uh, that we're, that more is asked of us in a certain sense than you would have necessarily, you know, on a feature film, oddly. The, the audience, yeah. this isn't TV anymore. The audience now, they expect movie quality picture on their home TV, which we yeah. didn't have to give them in the past on TV. You went to the theater for that. And now that's what they expect. So, um, expect a flushing toilet, I'm sure. Yeah. I, I apparently, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. the they crew appreciates it. To actually <laughs> just not be filled with blank Xerox paper. Exactly. You know, medical files now, but it's also the directors. Why is, yeah. you know, you, you're not going to have, you're not going to open a folder from a prop house and find, you know, invoices from a plumbing company in New York from 1920s. Like if you got it, you know, just, you know, everything is, so much more exact and it yeah. is more but it's more fulfilling too if you have the means mm -hmm. to do it it's it's great if you and you got the crew you know good people it can yeah. be great you really are building worlds you know, well, you know exactly and I, you know i find that you know um as a student you don't have the experience to know what's going to come up. And if you surround yourself, you know, when we were first starting out, you surround yourself around good people. They're helping you see problems ahead. And, you know, what I started noticing on this was like, if I'm getting like soapstone for the kitchen cut, I might as well have two sets cut at the same time and put it against a wall somewhere. 
because you just never know. And it's that kind of stuff you've been burned before where, you know, over the weekend, the grips have been climbing on your set and they crack it. And now we look like the ones that weren't ready, you know? Um, it's all that kind of stuff that like, that's what I like doing is like staying ahead of the machine. So you guys, that's a good place to ask how much prep time did you have each of you prep time seemed to have gotten shorter and shorter. So, but you've done pretty elaborate things. So how much prep time did you have for each of these? I had nine weeks. Well, that's pretty good. John. I, I had about, uh, I'd say two and a half months because of the complexity, because we're, we're making a functioning network. Yeah. Everything worked. Yeah. It was extremely, and, and I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful too, that I went with the producers and the showrunner to the actual studios, which was fantastic. Um, I, it would not have been the same, you know, show if we hadn't had, you know, that amount. And, and um, you know, it's interesting. Um, we had some of the guys from the, we had a director from the Today Show come in and actually be the, our control room director. And he was shocked that we had come up with a, a, an anchor desk. He said it took us years and we went through 12 of them. And, <laughs> and, and you know, I, it was a great compliment, but it was also this world is so complex and there's so, you know, one person's six feet tall, one person's four feet tall mm -hmm. and they have to stand at the same heights and it all has to work from many angles. It's wow. it. And so that was, you know, that's why I was grateful for it. The producers were fantastic and they said, this is, you know, this is not, you know, we're not going to do this in a month and a half. It just can't be done. Even the assets, creating all the assets. It's fantastic you know, that you had producers that felt that agreed with you. Yes, we had great. Our creative producer was fantastic, and he let us explore things. He said, "Let's do it right," mm -hmm. and let's, you know, um, we're very lucky. Rare. And Mark, three weeks. <laughs> uh, no, I think we. I think in the end it was around six. Not bad. Uh, oh, you know, it's our comedy. Six weeks. Six weeks. Uh, and I'm, I've been used to in the past doing very, very big things in very small amounts of time. So that. that worked. Um, and, uh, but you know, Rob, uh, McElhinney, the, the showrunner was, he, he worked on Sunny in Philadelphia. They made the first two episodes for that for under $300. So it, yeah, yes. Yeah, and you know the first season they didn't have Danny to you know that again? the whole story. I'm not. Yeah, it was gonna make it sort of like what we do on an iPhone now. So he was used to. He had been. He had been in a very low budget space for his entire career. He started in his twenties, mid twenties, and that shows now 14 new seasons. Um, wow. So coming into this, the good news was is that he wanted more quality out of it. He wanted to do something different that way, and so he pushed for that. Um, and Apple were great. They you know, they came in with a budget number and you work that thing. And, and, but it was a constant conversation and they, they were sincerely interested in something that wasn't, you know, they didn't want the same uh, template basically. It's like, this is how half hour comedy is done kids. So this is what you're going to do. They were like, no, we'll, if they would listen to an argument. If you wanted something more or something, Rob wanted it, we would generally get it. So that was, it was fine. I mean, it was a bit short, but as I said, I'm not unused to that. That was fine. All right, I have specific questions for you guys um, that these uh, the, the students have asked. Let's see, like for one, uh, Naaman, uh, you seem to have worked on a lot of films with dark, intense action and psychological drama. How does this play into your design? How do you keep each show visually distinct and do you feel pigeonholed? All right, that pigeonhole question is going to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think, I, no, I don't feel pigeonholed. Okay. Um, I, I feel like um, I like to dip my toes in a little bit of, you know, everything. Um, and, it, you know, it's funny to hear John talk about his show and how much he knows about news broadcast now. It's like we become pros in, for the moment that we're on these shows. Like, I feel like I can cook like a chef after being on my show. Uh, I, you know, I also feel like I, 
you know, like I'm, I'm a master of brownstones. Now talk to me in like three, four years, I'll forget it all. And I'm on to the next, like whatever. Um, but I, you know, this show in particular, knowing that we were going to spend so much time in the house um, and having worked with Knight before, I kind of knew what he was expecting. And, and it was fun for me to be able to play in like the different levels of the house. And like, you know, Leanne's third floor hadn't been remodeled. So it had a, a little bit of a past from, um, you know, from her parents, from, from Dorothy's parents. And we could actually like play with a bit of a story with the house, which was kind of fun. You know, when you go in, you pick out a box or whatever it had, you know, Dorothy's name on it or her mom or grand. So, you know, that kind of stuff, depending on the film you're on, you just kind of embrace it differently is my experience. And you kind of go down that rabbit hole of like, who is this person? You know, a couple, I've done one where the, you know, the villain was a war veteran and you kind of go down like, well, what would that guy have? And what's his past? And what did he do in the military? And, you know, so no, I think, I think each film, like, I think that's at least what drives me. And I'm sure it's what drives these, the, the other guys is just that, um, the, you, you just research and come up with like the weirdest facts of stuff we shouldn't know. And then you put it all in the bank and then you head to the next one, you know? Yeah. It's a great opportunity. The creativity, a lot of it comes out of that research and it's, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. John, Mark thoughts on pigeonholing or well, how you get, you know, I think, started? I think that's a really good point. And that's what I also find interesting is learning about these subcultures. These people, for instance, in the morning show, they get up at 2 a.m. They do this. They go home at uh, at noon and then they do, they do it for 30 years. They're like they reminded me of, uh, you know, people who work in a submarine. They don't see the daylight. They have a they the show is so structured. Every second has a plan and there are 100 feeds coming in that are looking at and and the people who do it they're lifers. They're, they have their whole, they have their own terminology. They have their own bars they go to. It is a complete, oh, wow. and I love finding out about that with every project. That's digging into these subcultures and learning about them. We are, I think a lot of production designers are, what's the saying? Um, uh, you know, we're, um, we're not experts on anything, but we know a little about every, you know, um, but that's what I always try to do something new. I'd never done a, uh, you know, a morning show or a TV show, uh, you know, set before. That's what drew me to that. And I always look for some new subculture to, to learn about is the fascinating thing. Yeah. Love it. Okay, too. Mark, do you want to talk about that? Or I have some questions for you about designing for comedy, but. Uh, go ahead. And I might touch on it in that just to. Okay. Well, um, somebody writes they're a big fan of Rob and Charlie from It's Always Sunny. Uh, there was a definitive look to that series, and because they created Mythic Quest, did you talk to them about creating a totally different feel, or did they stick to a similar template? How, how did you achieve that? You have already addressed this a little bit, but if you want to talk, yeah, about I, I, you know, Rob, I think wanted to move on. I mean, Sunny is is it, the, again. Uh, the commonality between the two shows are, is a group of people who really can't stand each other, but cannot get away from each other for different, different reasons. But, and it's hilarious and great. And also those guys, Charlie and, and Rob, the whole cast, they improv a lot. So they have the script and it's very defined. They come in and it's, it's, you come in, it's like watching a, uh, basically, you know, three hours of comedy when you go to the set. It's like a stand up. It's amazing. They're so good. Charlie day, Rob, they're geniuses, incredible. Uh, so no, I, Rob wanted something fresh, I think. I mean, he knew that there was gonna be enough commonality in the characterizations and so forth and how that was gonna work. So he really pushed for something more. He wanted something more. He wanted to spend some money in a way because he had been so constrained <laughs> on Sunny. And so, and Apple was happy to do it. Um, and I think- And you did this in LA, Mark? Yeah. And so did you go to a warehouse? Were you on a soundstage? Where did you well, do we were, Well, uh, there, I, I've forgotten the name of the studio, probably consciously, because uh, let's just say we had, a, we had a nickname for the place, which I can't repeat over the air. Um, uh, yes, uh, it, was, it was a difficult place, but it was, it was fine. It was a converted 
set of warehouses uh, in Ladera Heights, and it was it was dark and dank and strange, and but it was still one of the most fun shows I've ever worked on, just because of the people involved. Because uh, uh, it was so creative. Had, how high was your building? How high uh, oh, I don't know. It's because classic sort of converted warehouse. I think it was twenty four feet. We had to come in under that. And we're sort of a modified story and a half you know, because we have the taller office and so forth. And yeah. it's you know, kind of a big unit set where, and then we have, of course, because it's television and it's half hour, you're reconverting spaces to make other offices like, you know, um, CW's character, which is the great F Murray Abraham. And that was another thing, an incredible thing to work with, with one of my heroes, you know, it's like, yeah. and they, and he was so much fun on that show. He's hilarious. So we had to make one of his, you know, we had to make his office, but it was carved out of a portion of those offices you saw and we would change over and so forth. So that was, that was fun. Uh, but no, I think uh, uh, Rob gave us quite a, you know, free reign with it. Okay. Oh, Naaman, your, your ceiling height you said was 18, which is really quite low. John, did you shoot yours in LA or New York? We were at uh, Sony. We shot it at okay. Sony, so we had a huge stage. Yeah. And we were able to make uh, Jennifer Aniston's apartment, you know, at 30 foot ceilings, which is, you know, wow. I noticed not that. Not do every day. So it was <laughs> No, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah, it was, it was great. You know, yeah. and it's not going to happen forever. So. Did you put glass in those windows? What's that? Did you put glass in those windows? Oh yeah, they all gimbled. Oh, yeah. They all, they gimbled two ways. It yeah. was a, quite a, quite a feat. That rain great. bars. Yeah, that yeah. Great. Everything. Thank all right. You. Let's see. Um, okay, for everybody, uh, when you approach a show that has strong tonal characteristics, such as Servant or American Horror Story. Um, are there specific factors and elements you take into account when approaching the execution of designing for that specific genre? I mean, I feel like I touched base on that with mine. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. you know, tonally every show, depending on what genre it is, you kind of commit to one tone, hopefully. And as, you know, as a group and a collaborative effort with costume and DP and, you know, all of that, you're, at, you, you know, you hope that everybody's in the same sandbox. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think I can address it in a slightly different way that, you know, taking Horror Story, for example, I did five years of that show. And it, it was an interesting challenge because you're, you're, every year was a new, completely new setting and new characters. But the there was a tonal quality that had to play through all, all the seasons to an extent. Um, and, you know, and how much of that is the design and how much is the cinematography and simply the acting, the script and all, all everything contributes. But you had to do two things at once, which was make make the world distinct uh, and totally correct for the story of that season, but also be cognizant, especially as the years go on, of what is what are the commonalities between the seasons so that it is seen as a sort of suite of of distinct but connected narratives which we now see you know ryan has connected everything up and there's all these interplay which of course didn't exist when we started in year one yeah. but um i mean and that was that show is amazing because you were going from you know haunted house in contemporary la to 1960s you know asylum in massachusetts to you know a, a new orleans uh, antebellum mansion to a freak show in you know jupiter florida to art deco hotel in los angeles in the from the you know twenties to present day, so it was it was like having a career production design in one in one five year stint on a show. But, a pretty wide spectrum, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but I think it, it is those things where I, it's it's almost diff it's difficult to say how you're going to achieve those those tonal that tonal consistency as time grows. You know that vocabulary develops amongst the whole creative crew. I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers that question. But. It was kind of a yeah, but it, and, question well, and say, but it had a lot of good points. To even complicate that more, I mean, we have five or six different directors and three DPs within a season. I, you never have that in film. So that was like, whoa, what? Yeah. Like, we got to well. now get this person up to speed <laughs> and hope they're like in the same tone and language of the film and like the actors then are going like wait who's this person like they they don't yeah. get this at all i was like i was actually really surprised at 
the it wasn't dysfunction, but it was more like you guys actually do this to yourselves. Like you <laughs> choose to do it this way. Um, but it made it more interesting for sure. You definitely see, hopefully there's not any like huge tones between the episodes, but as someone working on it, you know who that person was and like wh where the breaks were on, yeah. on yeah. particular episodes. The designer, if you're consistent in the show, becomes the sort of the, the keeper of the DNA in many respects. And Very when, yeah. when directors come in, you're in the scout van with them or you're having your meetings with them, you're the person more than anyone else really conveying the creative tone of the show because you're spending much more time with them than the showrunner who might even be across the continent in some cases. Yeah. Um, yeah, you got to put your foot down when other yeah, people are just yeah. kind of like going, oh, I don't know, that might yeah, work. I mean, it's like, no, it's, it's, it's actually be like not going to work. Want. No, yeah. I, yeah, I, you become the scold. You become the person, like the mom, can I, can I uh, shoot it, in a place that doesn't match anything we ever did? No. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're going to ask me again? You're going to keep asking me because it's mm. cool? Or, yeah. No, you become the scold. And yeah, uh, that, you know, it's, you know. So true, but it, it is the most different thing about a film, you know, and versus these series where you just are you're so consistent, you just block shoot and you just keep moving, and but TV is just you're more authorial in television, is what I would venture more what to say. authorial. You have more say in how the narrative even is going to play out because the spaces you create, especially if the scripts have not been predetermined, good point. They Very write point. to the spaces. Very um, much. And, and that has a really profound effect on how things work. I mean, certainly in horror story, it was that way. I mean, I would think, I mean, John and naming both of your shows, I would think that really, I mean, because of the specificity of each of them as these sort of character sets, they really are characters, obviously. Yeah. They, they seem to, I can just see that both the DP and the directors are led down to certain solutions and ideas because of the design you created. You can yeah, just- Yeah, I, I try, you know, that's getting, I mean, getting good collaboration too is something um, that is so great. On some shows, I wish it was better. And on some, it is so wonderful because you can save money, you can save time. You, when you get that language down, it's, it's you know, great. I, you know, you almost want to stay with shows yeah. Even if they're not good, good as far as the, the script writing, be, because oh, this show, you know, this guy should have died two episodes, you know, two seasons ago. But we're going to stay on the show because we are we are all just working and making these, you know, tonally beautiful things. Um, and yeah. and you know that is that is true. You know the the also one could wish that maybe designers would be respected. A little mm. bit more and like they used to be this is never going to happen like in the 40s mm. when yeah. you know the designer would 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 have you know and, um, and not from a pompous way just like this this you know listen to this person they can save money they can cut you know like you know they can and they also you also become the person that corrals the dp and yeah. and the director who comes in they don't they don't have time to talk you become the person who is binding the whole production together. So this, you know, you can really make or break um, it. And not just with the design, but just with, we got a show to do. We got 12 yeah. days to shoot it. How can I, how can I get, you know, how prioritize. Can I Mark said, the showrunner is, is not even in the continent. And it, you know, so the showrunner trusts you, go yeah. find those locations. You know what, the, you know what it is. Here's the script. But I like that when the producers say, this is, this is true. Look at yeah. this. The, this you know, job. The show, yeah, the the you know the the line producer and the production designer are going to get this show done in twelve days. It's going to yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, I always find I always find it weird that when I design sets, I design sets for angles and for layers, and like I have what you know, DP walks in and starts kind of like doing this, and you're like, I, I do have those. If you'd Kinda like me to up. show you what it's all designed around, oh, you know, well, it's the eternal. Yeah. Uh, well, it's like, it, it's you know, it's, it's re it? but it is really refreshing when, when, you know, either the, the DP or the director says, so what were you thinking here? And you're like, all right, cool. Let's let, you know, I'll show you what I was thinking. And then you kind of riff on it from there and you start getting more and more input, you know, cause it, if you stand back, I mean, they might not even put the camera where the, you know, we build sets and we always have our strike zone, I like to call it. 
And there's many times you walk in and you're like, guys, are you shooting against that wall for real? It, like, yeah, it, it, oh. the, uh, I, you know, and Betty, on Ugly Betty, I did, and I don't know if you guys know that show, but it was it was a you know a, a fashion magazine, very high end fashion, really a fantasy. It wasn't realistic at all, but that was the point that you know the character of Betty is this fish out of water from Queens, Hispanic woman from Queens. She comes in and it's just you know you know insanely uh, pushed in terms of uh, sort of visual stylization, very modernist. And it was very based in symmetry, symmetrical views, multiple frames, frames in frames, you know, using frames to, as an objectifying device, all that sort of stuff. But that was conscious. It was like, these are the angles. And in a way, knowing how, and th that was, that was upsetting broadcast should have been cable. And it was knowing that they weren't even going to ask. It's like they fell into hmm. A pattern of shooting because really there were no other way there were really specific ways to shoot it and if you came off it was like the shot would fall apart so you'd right. be like and they'd always end up some of coming around uh and then i designed the house in queens well, everything is asymmetry everything you couldn't shoot a frame in frame everything had to be off angle and asymmetrical in terms of the frame specifically the way it was laid out and it very consciously to create that that distinction so i find you know, I don't want to be subversive, but sometimes you, you're you're consigned to that because of the time frame. You're never going to be able to actually talk to the person about the vocabulary of the set. They're going to come in and go, "Okay, we're, you know, we're oh, shooting." Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's uh, true. Did I hear you say you didn't want to be subversive? We can talk about that. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> um, you know John, me too well, Vinny. <laughs> here's a specific question for you, John. Uh, on the morning show, the scenes shot around. <laughs> And revolving the canyon fires were those scenes shot on location or soundstage and then digitally composited how did you approach that that was shot in calabasas and some areas that did have burn damage we okay. augmented those and then we a lot of that takes place in the mobile units that the news crew the brings in right. which were on a stage and we uh you know did cgi and it set extensions um, we did a lot of set extensions. So it was a mix, basically. Um, yeah. Set extensions, we'd find maybe a burned area, you know, extend it. And then we'd had our, um, you know, the news camp that goes there that they use as their base camp to report from. Some of that was on location. Most of it was on a green screen stage. So it was a mix. It was it was a good mix. It, it seemed flawless. Um, how soon after the fires did you shoot those? Were you pretty quick? That was, I think that was episode seven. I felt it was a bold move to do this because I felt, you know, I didn't want to be shooting in places where people died. I didn't want to be shooting in places. I felt it was maybe a little too soon to do that, but I think it was okay. Um, you know, to just go in there because of what happened and, and, you know, but there is something about our show that is predatory and morning shows are predatory. So I thought, okay, as long as no one died where we were shooting, I, I, I was like, I don't want to go somewhere where, you know, that happened. Yeah. But we yeah. created, you know, burnt facades of buildings and, you know, that kind of thing, where, you know, where we needed it. Naaman, somebody wants mm -hmm. to know about your modeling making experience and projects and how that and in, that aspect of the industry has changed. Um, we are just finishing up here soon, you guys. So if there's anything, you know, I'll ask you a couple more questions, but if there's anything you want to, if that's come to you that you want to say in, you know, in ending as you finish up. Well, um, I, I started out as a model maker. That was my, that was my trade. Um, I, I had um, just a quick history of the model making for me. I had an uncle who was a production designer, Tom Sanders, who had done, you know, bright, Saving Private Ryan and Dracula and Braveheart. And I was the kid that would sit in the shop with him and, and be cutting his doors and his pieces and helping him kit bash. Wow. And then I became, you know, 19, 20 years old. And, um, you know, I just got in with him and became his personal model maker. Now he was a model maker much more talented than I was, and that was his thought process. So what we would do, we would design the set before we had set designers, which was, you know, I didn't realize was twisted, but he and I, <laughs> he and I would make the, the, the village or the, 
um, the vehicle or whatever it was. And then we'd cut that apart and we'd give it to the set designer and say, here you go. So when I got to a certain point and working for other production designers, it was like, wait, the, the the mo model? wait, the models, I thought those started first. And it was like, <laughs> no, you guys just build models of stuff we draw. And so I hit a point where um, I, I realized modeling, I, I actually, there was a moment when I thought, you know what, if I want to keep doing this, I need to learn how to do it on the computer. And I started going down that road and realized the last thing I want to do is sit in front of a computer. So I quickly just realized that, you know, there's, you know, probably six or 10 model makers in the industry. And it's really a dying trade as far as proper, good model makers. And, you know, it, and my last film as a model maker was uh, Pirates 2 and 3. And at the end of that, I thought they can't get any better than this. I have to move on. But when I say move on, I still build many of my own models. I still will, you know, start my process with a model and do the handoff or work with a model maker. So my brain, just the way I was brought up and trained, leans heavy in the 3D of, you know, being able, there's nothing, all these guys can tell you, there's nothing like having a production meeting or a director's meeting around a physical model. It changes everything. I was going to ask you, I, it's, I bet your experience and the way you approach something is still models first, right? And you answered that. Yeah, because that's yeah. how you think. I, actually, I know a lot of people that start with models in some form, you know, because yep. it helps you figure out how you're going to. If you, do you them do them if you do them proper, you run into all the problems you're going to run into in construction. It's just smaller. If it took you a half a day longer to build the model, well, that's going to be about three weeks in full scale. <laughs> you hit those problems and you, you, you start working the solution. It's a lot like set designers now that only know how to do it on the computer. They don't know what the problems are. They just know that they can, you know, draw something where an old school pencil person had to actually pen and paper, find the product, put the dimensions on of what that was, find that piece, draw it in. And like the best set designers, in my opinion, are the, the, the pencil guys that went from pencil to computer and go both ways. Because yeah. if the, you know, it's like that old saying, you know, if the power goes out, I can still draw. You know, and but it's more of it's it's deeper than that. It's they know how much information construction needs. They know, you know, so that's really important for you know all these students to realize is like you can take classes and you can do stuff, but really at the end of the day, get in, get in with some really good people, dig in, ask, learn. You know, there's some really talented trades people out there who are more than willing to give you everything they have. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people are scared and it's intimidating. And I can remember, you know, my uncle used to say, listen, don't kiss my ass. Like, I'm not the one that hires you. It's going to be all these people who are hiring you. So your best bet is just to give them some coffee and stand over their shoulder, ask them if you can take drawings home and trace them. You know, there's all that kind of stuff that like you come out of school just thinking you're just going to jump right in. And, you know, just like John was saying, we are an industry just like anything else that has its own language. It has its own hierarchy. It has its own, um, you know, insecurities of people and all of that. So, you know, it's, it, it can seem discouraging, but the more you just dig in, you know, and get, get to know the processes, the better. That is really good advice for students. John, what would you advise students as we're finishing well, up here? I have to say that one thing, I didn't go to school for production design. I went for uh, fine art. One thing I learned coming from, you know, being an artist where I wasn't a collaborator was like, oh, well, here is my art. Take it or leave it. As a production designer, you have to really learn how to sell your ideas. This goes with <clears throat> white card model. If you want to sell producers on spending money, do the white card model. And you have to, you know, as a designer, you can't just assume I'm going to do these beautiful drawings. I'm going to do all this work and it's going to be accepted. You, one thing you really have to learn how to, and it only comes from, it's like when you go to meetings to get a, uh, with directors and producers, 
you have to do it to learn how to do it. No one can teach you how to sell yourself and how to do a good presentation. It's, I find that perception and presentation is a big part of being a designer and also giving a sense, not so much of confidence, it's just that we can do this and this is what you're going to get. And that's something that I think white card models and I try to sketch, bring some fabric and yeah. have a backup. Always have a backup, maybe not another model, but always anticipate that you have a place to go to with something, you know, and then yeah. I, you know, but I think that's real. It's, I don't know if they teach that, but I think learning how to present, how to sell your ideas and how to do a good presentation is really important as a designer. And you'll just, you'll learn it by working with really good people. And that's the best thing you can do is work with people you admire. And that you like what they do. Absolutely. Good advice. That's great advice. <coughs> Mark, I know yeah. you've got some advice. <laughs> yeah, well, I, since I teach, I, do, I don't want to take up so much air with stuff I've already told my students, but I suppose there's going to be other people other involved. People watching this than your students. That is true. Um, yeah, I would echo what both John and Naaman have said in terms of, uh, of learning from the, the good people around you. I remember when I got started, I, uh, I worked on, on Tombstone, <laughs> which dates me. Art director, I was the art director on Tombstone, which is a non-union film. But I, I learned, uh, just, in, just an example for drafting, um, I, I learned more about how to draft a proper set from watching and talking to the construction crew than I ever would have learned in class or that I did learn mm -hmm. in class. Um, just what made sense, what didn't make sense, what they needed, what they didn't need, you know, just to the expression of it <clears throat> and a design sense. I mean, I worked with these, with carpenters who were, who, who in some cases were Finnish carpenters and had a, had a beautiful design sense. And so listening to people so that the other thing is just humility. Don't assume that the guys on the floor, because they don't have a college education, don't have wisdom for you. They do. Everyone does, you know, costume designers, cinematographers, the key grip, the rigging grip, all of those people are going to have, you know, always have so much richness and there's so much to learn from those people as you go forward. Um, and that's the joy of it. There's such a, there's a real variety of backgrounds and of sensibilities just within one film crew. There's yeah. a whole world and, and, and that's a world you can learn from and, and sort of take pleasure in. And I think that's, one of the reasons I stick with it, it's not an easy job as you guys know, but one of the joys of it is, is if you find a really good group of people, as John was saying, I mean, you'll stay on a show longer than maybe you should because there's a certain kind of magical quality about the process, the, the product you're putting out, even if maybe the story is kind of suck or whatever's going on, but you're doing this work and you love the people you're working with. Yeah. So um, there's a lot to learn once you're out of the um, ivy colored walls. I think finishing on that note of, especially these days, making listen, the ability to listen as strong as any other ability is really important. So I think that's probably the best word of advice for people getting into the biz. Thanks, you guys. This has been really, really nice. Nice meeting you all. And uh, I guess I guess should say again, this is for the UCLA Design Showcase West Salon, and we've been talking with production designers. Thank you so much. Thanks. Clap Thank you. Clap. Thanks. Nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you as well.